morning, Exeter, that's what we want to say. <laughs> to start Good evening, Exeter. Right, welcome. I'm Kathy Brownback. I'm a teacher here at the Academy, and it is a great, great pleasure for me to introduce Sophie Robinson, who is the executive producer of the film we're going to see tonight. But first, I want to say just a word about um, tonight's screening. It's an event of a group called We the People, which some of you are familiar with and some of you may not be. It's a, um, an event sponsored by the Academy with three of the local churches, the Congregational, Episcopal, and Unitarian churches in the um, Exeter, uh, the uh, Water Street Bookstore. And the, the next um, event is on January 11th at the Unitarian Church with Kathleen Toomey, who is the Vice President of Riverwoods. And it's called, When Rockers Hit the Rocking Chair, New Ways of Getting Old. <laughs> So you can put that on your calendar if you'd like. Now to Sophie. Sophie grew up in Stratum at the Berry Hill Farm on Stratum Heights Road. Some of you may have known her parents, Buck and Caroline Robinson, who were avid environmentalists and active in the organic farming movement. Almost 10 years ago, when Sophie was my advisee here, my wonderful advisee here, she told me that one of her dreams was to come back to Exeter to teach environmental science. So I'm happy to say she was able to get started on that goal today by speaking in the law school assembly and meeting with students over lunch. And um, when she was a student here, she was known as an environmentalist. She was also known as the dominator of the girls' soccer team. She <laughs> scored many more hat-tricks than I can even remember to <laughs> have pretty much a weekly basis. And I think her record for, 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 uh, for, for goals still stands in the, in the team. So um, she, uh, she went on to Williams College and then led one of the major climate action networks in the country with 350 Massachusetts while working on a degree in sustainability at Harvard. Filmmaking began to emerge as one of the strongest ways to convey a message, and her production on the Age of Consequences is what's brought her here tonight. After the film, which runs for 78 minutes, Sophie will take questions and help us all think about the next steps that each of us can take. So please welcome Sophie Robinson. It's so good. talk at Exeter is to have your advisor be one of the people who organizes that. So thank you, Kathy. And thank you for the thorough embarrassment. Um, pretty pumped to be back here uh, in the assembly talk this morning. So thank you students for coming back after seeing the trailer this morning. I'm really excited to show you the full film. Um, I usually introduce this film as a horror film. So <laughs> FYI, it's about an hour of intense stuff. You're going to be punched in the gut for about an hour, and we try and leave you with a little bit of hope at the end. Um, I'll come back and talk about the film um, and answer your questions for a Q&A afterwards. Um, but mostly, just enjoy it. And my friends from League of Conservation Voters are here. You guys want to pull up your signs? They have been um, really great allies, already coordinated two screenings for the Age of Consequences. One was this past Sunday in Concord. So see them if you want to um, talk about local action on climate and environmental sustainability. Um, so with that, I think we'll just roll. Um, FYI, the film is not out in the public yet. Um, it'll be in theaters in January in New York City to start. Um, and you guys are actually super lucky. You're going to get the first DVD <laughs> copy in the PEA library. So I'm going to leave the copy that's being shown here tonight at the library so you can rent it. If you have friends who wanted to be here but couldn't, you can tell them they can rent it um, at the library. So I'll make sure that goes through. Um, yeah, enjoy, quote unquote, the show <laughs> to the best of your ability. And um, I'll see you in about 78 minutes. Anybody have questions? Can we get the film before film uh, before people in the incoming administration? We're trying. Um, if you have connections, anybody, we would love to have them. Um, but yeah, we're trying. It's been screened at a lot of really high level places. Um, the White House is on the list, but 
that'll, it's currently scheduled for the spring, which might be a little bit late. We'll see what we can do. Um, but it's going to be the UK Parliament, um, the Planetary Security Conference in The Hague on Sunday, and um, we're somewhere else really cool, but it's going to be Berlin, Brussels, um, yeah, and uh, NATO as well. So it's been getting around in the high level security places, um, trying to get it to, uh, <laughs> thank you, trying to get it to the incoming administration, but if anyone has a connection, let them know. Yeah, human population. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a really good point, and we never really talked about that specifically with um, our interviewees because we were trying to stay along the thesis of climate change as a national security threat, so we didn't really veer into other security threats that are arguably as important and really serious. Um, I think that's one of them, and I think they interact, right? So when Bangladesh has 30 million refugees, how are we going to deal with that? Um, we didn't talk to them necessarily about how to deal with population control. I think that's more of a political issue than it is a military one. Yeah. So I'm, I'm curious what were some of the surprises in the process, both on the hopeful side and the grim side? Yeah, um, good question. What were some of the surprises, hopeful and grim? Hmm. Um, hopeful, honestly, was that the military is taking this so seriously. I didn't know that before getting involved in this project. Um, and that does give me a lot of hope. I mean, as we said in the end, they're not going to solve climate change, but if they can be pushing for solutions and helping to push our politicians to see more clearly, that's cool and that's kind of why we wanted to make the film in the first place. Um, on the grim side, uh, it's really scary. It's, you know, the, the way they think about climate change is really scary and I didn't really understand how climate change had already been playing part in conflict to date before diving into this film and um, you know it's kind of sobering to think that it's already happening like this isn't a problem for our grandkids this is a problem for our parents this is already happening now and we have to take it seriously yeah you know, these were all uh, American speakers and did you talk with other countries about same yeah. Well, except for the guy from yeah, Munir, Munir Asman. Yeah, he it was so. He's one of my favorite interviewees. He was so cute. Um, we were both at the Paris Agreements, and he was texting me. He was like, "So, can we meet up for coffee?" Um, he's a really sweet guy. Um, yeah, he was the only international uh, general we talked to, most because we wanted to keep it on a U.S. focus. We wanted to be kind of hyper focused because whether we like it or not, the U.S. military is the only military in the world that is powerful as it is. I mean, we're kind of the 911 call when anything happens around the world. Um, we're the only country that has its hands in like so many countries. Um, why well, did I lose my train of thought? What was your question? My question was, you know, I was just asking, did you or Oh, did we interview others? Yeah, so, okay, that's right. So we wanted to stay on a US focus because of that um, attention and power that the US military holds. And because there's so much problem, like, we're the problem, too. So we wanted to have a U.S. focus so we could go to con Congress and be like, United States military cares about this. And it's interesting because we weren't really sure what kind of, um, like, hold this would have in a, a global audience. Um, Australia, Australians, for whatever reason, have been, like, so pumped about this film. Um, and we've been getting so many screening requests from groups and folks in Australia. It was screened to 70 um, Australian Defense, the Australian Defense Force. They loved it. I think the part about Bangladesh, they said, really hit home for them, um, thinking in a more international way. So, yeah, I, I, it's kind of a U.S. view on an international scope. Yeah, great. Uh-oh. Is this off? We can all hear you anyway. Okay. I'll just project. 
Um, wait, where's that other mic? Okay. Okay. Um, trying to make a change there a lot. Um, okay, so we partnered with a lot of security and climate um, organizations, some of whom were in the film. Uh, Stephen Cheney, who is the CEO um, of the American Security Project, they're, they're really excited about the film and they're bringing it on the European tour right now. He's the one who is at the UK Parliament um, in Berlin and Brussels, and it got on uh, BBC World News after that. He was interviewed with Munir, Munir Osman, which is pretty cool. Um, so we're working with climate security groups to get it to their audiences, and then we're also working with veteran groups to get it to their audiences. So it's kind of hard, you can't just say like, we want to show this film to conservatives in general. Like, okay, so how do you how do you do that? You kind of have to specifically focus on, you know, key audiences. And I think for us, the security community, which overlaps with the policy community, um, as well as veteran groups, are what we're focusing on. Yeah. What kind of negative feedback did you get as you made this? Negative feedback. Um, honestly, mostly it's been from the lefties. Who have said you are um, giving the military too much credit and are kind of pro-military? I think that's a really interesting argument, and I understand why people would feel that way. But if we had a critique of the military the way they would want us to, um, it wouldn't be played at any of these high security places. It would be dismissed immediately. So we really wanted to stay credible and have that bipartisan, um, you know, line that went through. Yeah, we that. Um, what skills do you think educators in this room should be helping to give our young folks to equip them to become part of the rest of this issue? Ooh, love that question. Um, I think more than anything, you know, it's so sobering. We all get it. I think even seeing this film, it's depressing to me. I don't even watch it anymore. Um, so I, I think young people especially get that. And it's like, sings home in a way that I think for older educators, you know, you, you can see it and it's really impact, impactful, but for the young folks, it's like, this is my life. I'm going to be alive when those 30 million refu refugees have nowhere to go. Like, what is that going to look like? So I think for the younger folks, like, I probably wouldn't screen this film to under um, 14. Like, high school, I don't say it's kid safe because I think, like, too much negative information can shut kids down, actually. Um, but I think it's really important then to have a perspective on what you can do. And that, you know, it is sobering, it is scary, but everybody in this room, you know, young people especially, get involved in the things you care about, but do it with a lens of changing the world. And like, how can you be excited about what you want to be doing, but then also be doing it in a way that, you know, can come up with the solutions for our energy crisis? Or, you know, how can, if you want to get into politics, can you get into politics and be an advocate for the changes that we need? If you're um, an artist, can you do documentary filmmaking? Can you do art projects that help folks? I mean, there are just so many different ways that you can get involved. And I think the only thing that actually helps like that sense of depression and just being overwhelmed and um, hopelessness is action. And every individual's actions are small and seemingly insignificant. But all change happens from individuals. So we all just have to step up. And I think for young people in particular, you know, get involved and, and be the change that you want to see. So in the summary, you talked about the spectrum, spectrum of like allies. Yes. And you talked about how you want to shift them towards the uh, ally side. So I'm thinking, what would be the biggest challenge in like maybe trying to persuade those maybe in opposition to those who are neutral? Allies. Yeah. Um, in the assembly this morning, I talked about the spectrum of allies and how in organizing you try and shift people along the spectrum from um, active opposition to passive opposition, neutral to um, passive ally to active ally, and you're just always trying to kind of bring people along that spectrum. Um, the biggest challenges, I mean, there are a lot of them, but probably. The biggest challenge is that once people have a belief, it's really hard to change that belief. I think probably many of us in this room have tried to talk to family members, friends, you name it, who don't believe in climate change, who don't care, um, or a number of issues. You know, if you if you have a strong belief that something is not true or that it doesn't matter, it's really hard to be convinced in the other direction. 
Um, and I think the best way to do that is not through facts. Um, there's a lot of um, evidence that shows that facts actually shut, shut people down and make them go the other way. But um, I found that listening, meeting people where they're at, listening, and trying to ask questions about what they believe in and then how to reframe that, how to reframe climate change. We're talking about climate change. So how to reframe climate change in, in their viewpoint, in their lens. What do they care about? And how can I frame what I'm interested in talking about to what they're interested in talking about instead of just assuming that they'll be interested in talking about the same thing that I am? Have you uh, approached uh, Wall Street Finance um, <laughs> since uh, the economy here is so uh, uh, central, and I would think that this would affect them in a, in a major way, both in terms of opportunities and disaster. Yeah, um, we didn't because we just wanted to stick with the military angle. The economic angle is another really compelling one, and for conservative climate change groups, they focus usually on the economic angle and security angle. Um, the economic angle is really compelling, too. Um, insurance companies take climate change really seriously. There was a report that one of our interviewees was part of, Saul Sang, called Risky Business, and that is about the impacts of climate change and how it will impact the economy. So if you're interested in that angle, I would definitely look it up. Um, would love for you to make another film about that. <laughs> yeah. And, and yeah, in the back, make sure. Yeah, the we, I guess, is the filmmaking team. Um, we came together um, two years ago. I was a grassroots climate change organizer for 350 Massachusetts in Boston for two years. Saw the impact of film on organizing and decided I wanted to work with a company that did disruption and do the math, which were two films that were really influential in that space. Um, and that's PF Pictures, who are the guys that did this. So I found them and I was like, hey, I'm an organizer. Um, and I want to make a film with you guys. Like, let's let's do this. So we tried to come up with um, new topics. You know, how can we think about climate change in a way that will bring more people on board? Um, what's a new message that needs to be told, and who are the messengers that would best tell that story? Um, and so we started to think about what what hasn't been done. There are a lot of climate change films that are really preaching to the choir. You know, everybody who goes to see a lot of climate change films is already on board with that message. So we wanted to try something a little bit different. Um, and try and take an angle that most people hadn't heard of that's been, been out there for a long time, as we talked about. The military's taking climate change seriously and thought of it as a security threat for over a decade. Um, so when we started doing research around, we, well, first of all, we kind of thought of this um, conflict, you know, war. How is climate change going to increase conflict in the future? It's going to be probably mostly over water, we thought at the beginning. Maybe this is going to be a film about water wars. Um, and then we started to do more research and we stumbled upon the way the um, Pentagon thinks about climate change, which is a threat multiplier. And we thought that was a really compelling angle and way of framing and that if we could get those voices in film, that would be really compelling, which I hope you find it is. I think we should probably wrap it here. So Great. thank you so much. Yeah.